Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning with a desire to hear from you and learn from your word. Lord, you are the true God. You are the great, you are great, and your name is great. And you are the living and everlasting God. It is you who made the earth by your power. You who established the world by your wisdom, as we read in Jeremiah chapter 10. We know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself. It's not for us to direct our steps. And you brought us here this morning to learn from your word. Would you please open our eyes so that we might see your truth and give us ears to hear and hearts to obey you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. He was a good friend of mine. I never understood a single word he said, but I helped him drink his wine. Now, many people are probably more familiar with that song which has nothing to do with the Bible than the man in the message of Jeremiah himself. How many of you thought of that song this week as you were reading Jeremiah? I'm sure. Oh, come on. I know. I know. Yeah. Jeremiah was not a bullfrog, but you know what he was? He was a bullhorn. He was a bullhorn for God. He was given one of the hardest ministry assignments written about in the Bible. And even though he wasn't fruitful, He was faithful. He was a bullhorn for God. Here's where we're headed this morning. I want to talk a little bit about the background of the book of Jeremiah, the background about the man, Jeremiah, two big themes that are found in the book, and then talk about his calling and and ministry assignment in chapter one. I want to share with you a holistic tool that comes right out of the book of Jeremiah. And it's something that you can use with your yes. unbelievers. Uh, I'm going to do an overview and some commentary through the chapters of chapters 1 through 33, which I'm covering. And then probably most importantly, Jeremiah points us to Jesus. That's what I love most. The whole Bible points us to you study it. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the for 40 years. From the end of the Assyrian period until Judah was destroyed by Babylon, Jeremiah prophesied of the coming judgment of God upon through the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom. During his history, he spanned the reign of five different kings. Josiah, who was a good king or a reformer, then Jehoahaz, which was son, and he only lasted three months and was taken to Egypt. Kim, who is Jehoahaz's brother, he lasted a year. And then Jehoiachin lasted only three months. And then finally, King Zedekiah. And most of you know, he had the unfortunate privilege of watching his sons be killed and then having his eyes gouged out. Man, terrible stuff. But we're given an intimate look into the prophet's own heart as he brings God's message to his fellow countrymen. The book begins in references to the event that Jeremiah was best known for predicting, the fall of Jerusalem. Jeremiah the man, he was born in 650 B.C. Small village by Jerusalem. His father was a priest. So it would have made sense for him to be a priest since his father was a priest. His name in Hebrew means the Lord exalts. He was called to be a prophet before he was even born. We're going to look at that passage in a minute. God instructs him never to marry in chapter 16, verse 2. He was a persecuted prophet, one of the most persecuted prophets. We often refer to him as a weeping prophet because of this. He was threatened in his hometown. 
He was rejected by both religious leaders and commoners. He was put in stocks, publicly humiliated, thrown into a cistern to die. And tradition says he fled to Egypt with a small group of exiles and was killed by his own countrymen there. This guy had a tough life. And he shared a very tough message. The two themes of the book are, I will punish and I will restore. In nine, chapter 9, verse 25, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. And then in chapter 30, verse 17, For I will restore you to health, and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord. Those two themes, I will punish, and I will restore, are found. And they're both uh, personal themes and political themes. And it, in the sense that he really calls out sin in a in a in a we don't see in, in other books and we're going to delve into that a little bit political in that he tells that the destruction is going to come through i mean he tells them that destruction is going to happen and that nebuchadnezzar is the, the god's chosen instrument of the judgment and he even encourages he even gives them political advice and says don't cooperate with egypt just just cooperate with babylon so let's reflect on his calling in chapter one Sias, king, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of zedekiah son of josiah king of judah when the people of jerusalem went into exile the word of the lord came to me saying before i formed you in the womb i knew you before you were born i set you apart I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. God had a specific mission and plan for Jeremiah before he was even conceived. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you and I did you a prophet to the yes, this is a huge statement about how God values life before birth. And this verse, along with Psalm 139, for my personal convictions about this issue. It says God knew him before he was born. You know, there's a story about a bioethics professor who was trying to challenge his class on that multi-human thinking. And so he asked the class, he said, following data, how would you advise this woman who is pregnant with her fifth son? Her husband has syphilis. She has tuberculosis. The first child was born blind. The second child died. The third child was born deaf. The fourth child had tuberculosis. So what would you advise her to do? She's pregnant with her fifth child. Should she have the baby or not? Overwhelming majority of the class said, I don't think she should have that baby. And then the professor says, congratulations. You've just terminated one of the world's greatest composers, Beethoven. That was the history of Beethoven's family. People would read his writings where he predicted the return from captivity and that would, and they would find great hope and comfort for generations to come as they waited those 70 years of captivity. But the third reason I think he was, he was successful is because his message is being used to impact lives today. I've seen people's lives completely change because of his words. And let me show you what I mean. And this ties in with this illustration I want to share with you. I've used this one verse and talked to countless young men and women about the gospel using this one verse. It's Jeremiah 2.13. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, 
the spring of living water and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. I want to teach you a simple illustration called the well illustration that's based on Jeremiah 2.13. It's something you can share with an unbelieving friend over lunch. You can learn this and you can use it to help your friends know Jesus. I lead up to sharing this just by practicing spiritual curiosity with my non-believing friend. I did this actually in the gym just the other day. I was talking to a guy and he was showing me pictures that he takes. He goes out and he takes pictures of the sky and he showed me this picture that had hundreds of stars. He, 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 get, he goes out at two in the morning and takes these amazing pictures, you know, of mountains and, and the stars in the background. And I, I looked at him, I said, when I see that, I, I can't help but think of God. You know, and this guy's this guy's an atheist. And so it, it led into this this discussion. But at some point, I'll simply ask the person, can I show you an illustration that talks about what people trust and why? And I've never had anybody say no. Then I find a blank piece of paper or a napkin, and then I write this statement on top. People follow, give themselves to, put their trust in, whatever they believe will give them life. And I explain by the word life, what I mean is that people believe, whatever people believe are their deepest needs, security, satisfaction, respect, significance, love. And I'll say, do you believe in this statement? What do you think of this statement? Do you agree with this statement? It's kind of hard not to agree with it. And then I'll say, okay, let's brainstorm some different examples of what people are following, give themselves to, putting their trust in. And I make all these shapes on the piece of paper and I start filling them in with, with different words. And usually I'll start, I'll say, hey, how about money? A lot of people, that's all they want, more money. I, if only I had more money, then I'd be happy. So I put, I'll put money in those boxes and I'll fill the boxes kind of like this. I'll put things in there like career, or actually we go back and forth. He'll say, they'll say one and I'll say one. Uh, and we just kind of fill these boxes in. Career, causes, sex, money. I'll mention Jesus at some point. I might also mention religion. So I want to just, I want, I want people to see the difference between Jesus and religion, the contrast there. Anyway, you can go on and on. You can talk about intellect, fitness, performance, looks, drugs, materialism, alcohol, other people's opinions, relationships, on and on and on. And then I'll write the Jeremiah 2.13 at the bottom of the paper, and I'll ask them to read it out loud. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Then I'll underline certain words as we're, dis as we're discussing. By the way, the thing I love about this, this illustration is it's a dialogue. It's not me preaching at them. It's us discussing truth together. You know, that's what I, I love about it. It's, I call it a dialogue tool. So I'll underline two sins and I'll say, you know, what are the two sins that people have committed against God? Oh, well, they've forsaken God, and then they've dug their own cisterns. Okay, well, forsaken, what, what, is, what does the word forsaken mean? Oh, it means to abandon or to leave. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. And then I'll underline cisterns, and I'll say, have you ever heard the word cistern? Do you know what a cistern is? And then we talk about what a cistern is and how it's like a big container that holds water and how they, in the ancient times, they would dig these pits and then make them so they would hold water because there's only two ways to get water back then. It, it, it comes from it, moving water or, or from the sky or, or it's being held somewhere. And then I'll say, how are these cisterns described? And he says, and he'll, they'll say broken. And I'll say, well, what happens to water in a broken pot? It, how it leaks out and it becomes useless. Then I'll draw cracks in all the different th boxes that we made, except for the box of Jesus. And I'll explain that these are wells that people go to to try to find life. But the problem is they never satisfy. They're leaky. They're cracked. And, I, and I'll say, you know, does this make sense? And then, and then I'll... I'll I'll usually share like maybe one or two of the wells that I tend to go to, things that I want to give my life to, things that are really important to me and how I've gone to those, but how they're, they're empty. And then I'll ask them, 
Which one of these one or two do you feel like you're looking at right now? And then what will happen to your life if you continue to try to find life in these things? Eventually, it'll become dry and empty. And then we turn and start talking about God. How is God described in this passage? Well, it says he's like a spring. What's the difference between a spring and a cistern? The spring never ends. It, it constantly flows. Then I'll talk about how Jesus came to be our savior. And he also claimed to be a spring of living water. And I'll ask them permission if I could show them one more Bible passage. And I turn to John chapter 4, verses 13 to 14, where Jesus said, well, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But it will, well, I give him will never be thirsty. The water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I, I, I'll, and then I'll just talk about the passage. And at this point, I might share my testimony or share another gospel illustration or just simply say, hey, I would love to meet with you more and just we could just read and discuss the gospel of John together. And I've done that. And I've seen countless lives change just because of this one little verse in the book of Jeremiah. By the way, this is what it looks like. I did it this week with a Bible study I lead. I did it with the whole Bible study. We talked about it. And people in the Bible study, even believers, were convicted by this verse and realized, you know what? I'm not turning to Jesus. I'm, I put some of these things, more. They're, they're more important to me than Jesus in my life. I need to turn away from those things and turn to Jesus, you know. So anyway, if you want to learn more about that, you know, please talk to me. I'd love to share that with you. One of the things that struck out with me, struck out to me as I read through the book of Jeremiah is how strong Jeremiah was on sin, calling out people's sin. He spoke a lot about sin. We just discussed in Jeremiah 2.13, he shows us that sin is like a form of idolatry. But then he calls out people's obvious sins, like in chapter 6, verse 13, he says, from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from the prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. He's calling them out for their sin. And then, I mean, they were doing some crazy stuff. And then chapter 7, verse 31, it says, and they built high places to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it even come into my mind. I mean, they were sacrificing children, following pagan practices. I mean, their sin, greed, and murdering children. This is serious problems. And then in chapter 2, verses 34 and 35, it says, Also, on your skirts is found the lifeblood of the guiltless poor. Yet in spite of all these things, you say, I am innocent. Surely his anger has turned from me. Behold, I bring you to judgment for saying, I have not sinned. <laughs> they didn't even acknowledge that they had an issue with sin, a problem with sin. And more on this, the lack, lack of awareness of sin. Can I ask Ray to read chapter 16, verses 10 to 12? When you tell these people all this and they ask you, why has the Lord decreed such a great disaster against us? What wrong have we done? What sin have we committed against the Lord our God? Then say to them, it is because your fathers forsook me, declares the Lord, and followed other gods and served and worshiped them. They forsook me and did not keep my law, but you have behaved more wickedly than your fathers. See how each of you is following the stubbornness of his evil heart instead of obeying me. So I will throw you out of this land into a land neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you will serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor." This convicted me. This convicted me. As I'm reading about all this, this calling out of sin, it made me think, like, am I soft on sin in my life? It's easy to call out sin in other people's lives. It's really hard to see sin in your own life. Like, for example, you could be like, man, that guy's a liar. He is a liar. 
And then someone might say, well, Greg, you lie too. They say, yeah, but when I lie, it's complicated. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, I'm thinking, you know, I, I was thinking about this. When's the last time I heard a sermon that was really hard on sin? The, the kind of sermon I used to hear back in the eighties, when I listened to Jim college preach, and I would leave the service shaken because I was convicted of sin in my life. I don't know. We don't, we don't hear those kind of messages anymore. Or it's we're just so easy on this on sin in our lives. I was thinking about the fight against pornography. What happened to that? Nobody, we just kind of like threw in the towel, like all these streaming services. The, the, the stuff out there is crazy, but nobody's fighting against it. Nobody cares. We just we just kind of accept it. Oh, I guess it's just the way it is. So then Jeremiah goes further and he says, you know what? Sin is 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 addictive in nature. And he calls out sin as addiction. Uh, Ray, would you read this? Chapter 2, verses 22 to 25. Although you wash yourself with soda and use an abundance of soap, the stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the sovereign Lord. How can you say I am not defiled? I have not run after the bales. See how you behaved in the valley and consider what you have done. You are a swift she-camel running here and there, a wild donkey accustomed to the desert, sniffing the wind in her craving. In her heat, who can restrain her? Any males that pursue her need not tire themselves at mating time. They will find her. Do not run until your feet are bare and your throat is dry. But you said, it's no use. I love foreign gods, and I must go after them. That last phrase, it's a bit chilling, isn't it? But you said, it's no use. I love foreign gods, and I must, I must go after them. That, my friends, is the language of addiction. Yeah, as I read these chapters, it's hard for me not to see the striking similarities to what's happened, what happened to Judah and what's happening in our own country. There's things that are just hauntingly familiar. For instance, we've decided to push God out of national life. We push God out of public schools. 67% of Americans believe there's no such thing as right and wrong. Did you know that? 67%. No such thing as right and wrong. Many religious leaders will say, if America doesn't turn soon, God's going to judge America. I'm wondering if it's already started. Maybe it started years ago. Because if you look at one of the first indicators that God has decided to judge a nation, what does he do? He turns that nation over to its own desires. That's one of the first things that happens. He just turns them. Okay, this is what you want. Go ahead. He turns them over. I came across this quote from this historian who said, of 22 civilizations that have appeared in history, 19 of them collapsed when they reached the moral state of the United States, the United States is in right now. And this, again, reminds me of Jeremiah's heartfelt message to his fellow countrymen, like in Jeremiah 3.13, he, he's begging them, return, O backslidden children, says the Lord, for I am, I am married to you. I will take you from one city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And then in chapter 3, verse 22, return, you backslidden children. That word backsliding is actually a Hebrew word, shovav something like that. And it appears 16 times in the Old Testament. Did you know the word backslide? Backsliding is in the Old Testament. It's in there 16 times. So what does it mean? It simply means to leave your original position. And that reminded me, like I was, I was on vacation and I was at the beach. I'm sure you've had this experience. You go out into the ocean with your family and within like 20 minutes, you realize and you, and you go out like right in front of your stuff, right? Because you don't, you want to watch and make sure nobody steals your cell phone and that kind of stuff. But in 30 minutes, like all of a sudden you're like a half a mile down the beach. It's like, and you're like, I didn't move anywhere, but the current pushed you. 
And that's just a reminder as believers, we're either moving forward or we're going backward. We're falling backward. My fear for myself and for, and for all of us is that the cultural waves that we're experiencing in the, right now are so big, they're pushing us backwards and we're not even aware of it. Just like we, just like what happens on the beach, man. So I think biblically, you could say, if you're not moving forward, you're backsliding. That's why it's so important. And that's why I love this Bible study. I love staying in the word is key to not falling back. Jeremiah uses lots of pictures in his messages, 21 different metaphors that he used in his preaching for judgment. Just a couple of them I'll mention. The judgment against Judah was like a hot wind. It was like a burning fire or a devouring lion. To portray Judah's enemies, Jeremiah used the shepherd metaphor. The generals and of the armies are shepherds and the armies are the flocks. That's from chapter 6, verse 3. The devastation caused by the invading armies is like the devastation caused by a fire. And boy, do we see that this week. You know, who would have ever thought a fire like that could break out on a place like Maui? But that is the, you see those images. It's devastating what happened there. And then the people are descri describe God's judgment as drinking poisoned water. Chapters five and six are the prophecies that happened during Josiah's reign. I want to read chapter 6, verse 13. He says, because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They've also healed the herd of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. That is interesting. It says, they've healed my people slightly saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. There were two groups of leaders that wanted to spare the people of panic during the impending invasion of Babylon. They were the politicians and the false prophets. The, the politicians tried to form alliances with other nations to prevent it from happening. The false prophets, on the other hand, wanted to preach fun messages, feel-good messages to keep God's judgment they didn't want to talk about God's judgment because they didn't want any of that negative stuff. So they just preached fun messages, like putting a Band-Aid on, on an arterial bleed, you know. Some, somebody described the condition of Jeremiah's world like this. The world is like a ship that is sinking, and the captain knows it, but none of the people on board know it. So the captain turns to the whole group of people on board and says, all the rules are off the table. If you're in third class, you can move up to first class. All the drinks are free. You can play pickleball in the dining room. You can do whatever you want. Just have fun. Have a good time. Now, what would the people on board think? They would say, man, this is a great captain. This guy's a great captain. The coolest captain ever. But what they don't know is that they'll be dead in 10 minutes. And that's that's kind of the picture of what was happening in Jeremiah's time. And honestly, I fear it's happening in our time. Chapter 7 through 10, we call the temple discourses because Jeremiah preached these at the gates of the temple to those who were going to church, people going to church and going to temple. Big Dan, would you read chapter 7, verses 1 to 4? This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house, and there proclaim his, this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah, who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is a temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. So I think what's happening here is people were saying, you know what, as long as I go to temple, it's going to be okay. As long as I go to church, everything's going to be okay. It's mentioned three times, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Why? Well, it could be because there's three main feasts that brought people to the temple of the Lord, you know, Passover, Pentecost, and the tabernacles. 
it it could be because there were actually three invasions from Babylon where they took it. There, there, there's Babylon invaded three times, but they retained the symbol of worship, but they threw out the substance of worship. And God cares more about the substance. God wants to know, do you really, do you really worship me? Do you really submit to me? Do you really love me? For them, it was all about the ritual done in a certain place rather than a relationship with a person. They wanted to keep the ritual in the place, but they, they forgot about the relationship. It's so easy to do. God tells Jeremiah 7 verse 16. Look at 7 verse 16. This is one of the most profound verses in the Bible. God tells Jeremiah not to pray for these people anymore. Don't pray for them anymore. This is the only time in the Bible when God says to one of his servants, stop praying because I won't even listen to you when you pray for these people. It's like God is saying, I'm done. I'm letting them have what they want. God knew that their hearts were hard and they weren't going to repent. But I love this passage in chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Ray, would you read this? Chapter 9, verses 23 to 24. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. I love these, I love these verses. The people around Jeremiah were boasting in, about their minds and their money and their might. They grew in their prosperity, but they'd forgotten God. Again, how can you not think about what's happening today? What about us? This didn't start recently. Look at what Abraham Lincoln wrote. He says this, we've grown in numbers, in wealth, in power, as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our own hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Whoa. Wow. That is, that is a guy who saw it for what it was, you know, a, a godly thinking leader. We have turned from God. We've forgotten God. And we think it's all about us and what we've done. And you know what? It creeps into the church, too. I mean, so many times, there's times when the worship songs are all about us. They're, they're all about us. And what, 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 bless us, God. What, what happened to the glory of God? Even when we plant churches, and I'm not saying this, I, I'm not saying this about our ch church specifically, but if you go to church planting school, you know what they teach you? They teach you to rely on secular marketing techniques. If you send out 20,000 postcards, you'll get, you'll get 100 people at your meeting. It's like, what? What happened to just a small group of people on their knees praying for their neighbors to come to Christ and churches starting organically, which is what Christ Community Chapel started that way. Let's, uh, let's move on. Let's move on. There, there'll be a time for comments and questions. Chapters 11 through 33 chapters 11 through 20 are filled with personal experiences of jeremiah and then i'm going to jump for sake of time to something that happens in chapter 20 that is just kind of profound chapter 20 verses 1 to 2 now Peshur the priest the son of immer who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Then Peshur beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. So he gets put in stocks because of his preaching. And then you jump to verse 9, you see how Jeremiah responds. And in the first part of verse 9, he says, I will not make mention of him, nor will I speak any more in his name. Here, here is Jeremiah, the prophet, quitting his mission. 
He's hanging up his cleats. He's walking off the field. He didn't want to be a prophet anymore. I guess you could say he wanted to join a nonprofit organization. Yes, that was a joke. But he quit. He quit. But you know what? What is so cool about it? He quit, but then it didn't last long. Because in his next breath, look at what he says in chapter 9, the second part. You, go, go ahead and read, read verse 9. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. I love that. I love that. I mean, he was he wanted to quit. He wanted to hang up his cleats, but then he couldn't because God's word was in him and wouldn't let him. And I, I can tell you as a as a missionary, I've had that experience. I've been discouraged at times in ministry and I felt like quitting. What's the thing that changes? It's not taking a vacation. It's not seeing a therapist. What changes is God's word will come into my heart and a verse like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 will come into my mind where it says, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And this also reminded me of like the two guys on the road to Emmaus, you know, what their response was, didn't our hearts burn when we heard him speaking? I love that. I don't know if you've had that experience with the Bible when you hear it, whether it's hearing a sermon or in your personal walk with the Lord. That's the I wish I had that every day. That, that burning, I, I want that so bad. So then jumping to chapter, chapters 20, 21 to 29, they illustrate the certainty of the captivity that's coming. In chapter 29, he sends a letter to the captives who won't even read it until years later. And he's going to tell them in this letter to prepare for a long stay, the 70 years. And just again, as a side note, I mentioned this earlier, the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem three separate times. The first time was in 605 BC, and that's when Daniel was taken, probably as a little boy. And then the second time was in 597 BC, where most of the leadership was taken captive, and at this time, as well as the no nobility. And then finally, in 586 BC, the temple on July 18th, July 18th, 586 BC, the temple was completely leveled and the people were taken away to Babylon. But then we read this passage and, and Rex, I'm going to have you read it. Chapter 29, verses 10 to 12. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Great. These words would provide great hope for those who read them, especially those who are waiting for those 70 years to pass. And then we jump to chapters 30 to 33, where we see predictions of God's future plans for Messiah and the new covenant. So Rex, would you read chapter 31, verses 31 to 33? Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I love that. God never gives up on people. He never gives up on people. And he, he promises this new covenant, this new covenant. Well, what's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant? Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you might say, between the law and Christ, what's the difference? Well, the old covenant, it's, it seems like tried to control their conduct. Don't murder. Don't, don't do these things. 
where the new covenant promises to change a person's character from the inside out. Somebody said that the difference between the old, the old covenant and the new covenant is kind of like the difference between being confined to reading sheet music if you're a musician and being able to play by ear what comes from your heart because of the Holy Spirit working in you. And we're blessed because we live in the new covenant times. We have the Holy Spirit. Okay, I want to close this morning by just talking about Jesus and Jeremiah. Jump ahead to the time of Jesus. Did you know that some people thought Jesus was like a resurrected or a new Jeremiah? In chapter 16 of Matthew, verses 13 and 14, when Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, and by the way, if you go to Israel with me, we will go to this exact place and we'll read this passage at this spot. It says, now Jesus came to the district of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do the people say that the son of man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others uh, uh, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jeremiah was mentioned. Isn't that interesting that Jeremiah is mentioned there? Well, how is Jesus like Jeremiah? Well, Jeremiah was tough on the religious leaders. <laughs> Jesus was tough on the religious leaders. But, you know, when he said, woe to you hypocrites. Jeremiah was also tender. And so was Jesus. When he says to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Jesus wept over Jerusalem and was known to be a man of sorrows, according to Isaiah. So you can see where people kind of got confused. Maybe this is Jeremiah. But I think a better way to think about it, Jesus was not Jeremiah, but Jeremiah points us to Jesus. See, Jesus is the true and better Jeremiah. And this is something, as you read through the Old Testament, I encourage you to look for this pattern where Jesus is the true and better Moses, the true and better Jeremiah. Well, how is he the true and better? Well, remember the beginning of my presentation when I talked about the man? That Jeremiah was born in a small town outside of Jerusalem. Jesus was raised in a small town outside of Jerusalem. Jeremiah never married. Jesus never married. Jeremiah was carried off to Egypt. Of course, it was later in his life. Jesus was carried off to Egypt as a child. Jeremiah was known to be a weeping prophet, a man of sorrows. J Jesus was called a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jeremiah was rejected by people in his hometown. So was Jesus. People conspired against him. The religious leaders, you know, conspired against him, wanted to kill him. S same with Jesus. Jeremiah was beaten and mocked and convicted in a show trial. So was Jesus. He was left for dead in the, in the ground in a cistern. And by the way, uh, an Ethiopian guy pulls him out of that cistern and saves his life. And there's a, a lot of people think Jeremiah only had two friends. One was his scribe, Baruch, who wrote most of this book down for us. And the other was this guy who rescued him out of the cistern. Those might have been his only two friends. Everybody else hated this guy because of his message. You know, he was put to death by his own people, according to tradition. So is Jesus. But... Jeremiah didn't see the results of his suffering, but Jesus did. In Isaiah 53, verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. And then in Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I love that phrase in there, for the joy set before him. What was the joy set before him? It, it was us. It was us. But then when you read about us in Jeremiah, you realize how wickedly sinful we are. We, we don't even realize the depths of our own sinfulness. But God loved us so much. It was a joy for him to sacrifice. See, I don't think until you grasp the depth of your sinfulness and the height of God's glory or his holiness, 
I don't know that you can really understand the gospel. You don't see how good it's the best news ever. The gospel is the best news ever. So many people at church hear the gospel and they just kind of yawn. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of deserve that. Do you really, do you really deserve what God did for you? None of us do. So the father said through Jeremiah, obey me and you will live. But he said to his son, obey me and you will die so that they may live. And the amazing thing is Jesus did. He did obey the father. And that's the gospel, the best news ever. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.